Hey everyone and welcome to episode 7 of the For the Future podcast. Today I have a conversation with Zilungi Lezimela. She is a PR and marketing manager having formerly worked at Funza Literacy Trust, an organization which aims to encourage reading in young children. Today she has recently started her own marketing firm, Atenjwa Media Consulting. She speaks about how public speaking and debating has helped her in her career, as well as her passion for education and literacy, particularly in her own language. Hope you enjoy. All right, so thank you so much, Zilungile, for taking the time to come on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the conversation. So... Firstly, I wanted to find out if you could explain to the audience a little bit more as to who you are and what is your story. Ha, who am I? That's a very big one, you know. It sounds like an uh, interview question, very befitting. So, uh, I mean, let's start from the beginning. I'm originally from the Eastern Cape, uh, Port St. John's. That's where I was born. I was socialized and sort of like brought up in Umtata. Um, after mm-hmm. finishing my studies, like my elementary education, I moved to East London. Um, where I did, you know, my tertiary schooling and such. Um, after East London, I then began yeah. working, uh, moved to Cape Town, which is where I've been for the past couple of years. I've just recently relocated um, to Pretoria. Uh, so that's where I am based uh, currently. So that's just who I am and where I'm from. Um, I am a social activist at heart more than anything else. I believe in social justice. Uh, especially upholding the rights of women and children. And I believe in equality also. I've spent a huge portion of my life, you know, um, in education and literacy and working very, um, very much in that space. So that's pr- pretty much what I do. Uh, by profession, I'm a public relations strategist. Um, I also work in marketing. So um, I am an entrepreneur. I am a public relations person, like it also. And I'm an activist. Yeah. Okay, that's that's quite an interesting. What I wanted to find out what drew you to working in education and particularly in literacy. Uh, I come from a rural space, right? Pots and Johns. I, I come from a, a place, a province, really, where all of the good things that you want, you have to kind of fight for them. Uh, I come from a province that could afford young people all of the things that we need to thrive and all of the things that we need to succeed. But in my opinion, unqualified opinion, I feel like there's a lot of mismanagement. Uh, there's a lot of malfunctions in administration, you know. Um, there's a lot of bottlenecks. We have our struggles in the province, but I believe that if we could work together to alleviate some of those struggles, our education system or our system of education could see a good shift in the province. So, um, and another thing, you know, growing up in, in that space, because I received my, you know, formative and elementary education in a rural space, right, before I went to private schools and all of that. And I know what the struggle is like. I know what it feels like to walk um, unimaginable kilometers to school and you are expected to get there and um, have a sober mind and be fresh and be able to receive information, you know, as though you just live next door to the school. Um, yeah. I know what it feels like to wake up in the morning and first head cattle before you can go to school. Um, I know those dynamics. I've seen those dynamics, um, even though I didn't get to experience them for a very long time in my life. But I, I, I know them all too well because every time I go home, I go home to the same thing. You know, nothing much has changed, you know, since then. And also, I, I know what it feels like to be in a classroom of more than 80 students with one teacher. You know, I mean, yeah. how does learning really take place in such a space? I know what it feels like to share a textbook, not even a new textbook for that matter. Um, I know what it feels like to not be taught in your mother's tongue and having a conference of the mind because you're absorbing information in a different language. Your mind processes it in a different language and you have to write it down in a different language as well. So I know all of those complexities, I've experienced them. I was fortunate to obviously get out of that you know, of that, I call it a rut, get out of that system and get into a, another system. But also the dynamics there as well. You know, you're coming from this kind of school and you're going to another different sort of school and a different sort of quartile. And you're also expected to, to, to behave and to grasp information from your counterparts. So I've, I've seen all of those struggles. I've, I've experienced education in, from different sides, from both sides of the spectrum. So 
why am I in the sector? I'm in the sector for my younger me. You know, I'm here for the six-year-old who was in that system, who's still there, who may not necessarily be me yeah. at this point, but I, I can do something about it. I'm particularly drawn to um, literacy and literary um, work, um, reading, writing, more so in my mother's time, is a course, which I didn't get the privilege of, of doing at school. So I think it is very important for me to give back in any way that I can. Because also I understand the problem, you know. <laughs> so it's better to try and um, work on the solution if you understand the problem. Yeah, yeah. No, that completely makes sense. And I think it's easy to tell that you're quite, you're quite driven by this. Uh, you've mentioned before, you know, driven by the, the rural, marginalized and segregated child who doesn't see beyond the grazing farms. You mentioned that in one of your uh, previous <laughs> interviews, actually. Um, so it's quite incredible to see that you're, you, 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 you've built off of that experience. And as you mentioned, you've trying to solve your own problems. Uh, why do you think that it's important to try and solve problems that you've experienced? Well, from that angle, you're not coming in from a spectator's point of view. You're coming in from a, you know, a personal point of view where you've experienced this. You, you know how it feels like. And like, can you imagine the complexity? Imagine a young person from rural Kukwala up there in the Eastern Cape or rural Shabia Lingana up there where there's limited internet connectivity and we've just had the pandemic and they were expected to learn via Zoom, via all of these uh, platforms that have never engaged with um, it, at any point. Um, I was also very fortunate to work for an organization that uses both technology and, and education and fuses it together to try and solve the problem, well, address some of the problems. So I, I like working in this space because I understand it, I've lived it, I'm socialized in this space. Um, my, my cousins are in this space, uh, my neighbor's children are still in this space, uh, people from my village are still in this space, but they're thriving, we are thriving so much, you know, despite the odds, um, yeah. despite all of the things that are, that are not done right, that haven't been done right, but be that as it may, we're just, you know, rolling with the punches, and I'm just, I'm just happy that I can be able to be instrumental to make someone's life a little bit easier and a little bit better than, you know, my life at a point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's quite incredible. And it, I think it also makes a lot of sense from a, a practical standpoint. Because mm. mm. I think yeah. that's, another, that's, another, that's another problem that we, that we have. And I think I, I am courageous enough to say this. We, we do have a, a problem, um, mm. especially in the NGO sector and in our communities, where you would find people who are not necessarily from this community, but are coming in to address the problems that exist in this particular community. You get what I'm trying to say? So I, I think it is incredibly important for, for us who've lived it, for, for us who've experienced it, to be in the forefront of the solution, holding hands with those who have the will and the skills to, to assist. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I also saw that you have quite a lot of experience in debating and public speaking, you know, specifically having been a part of Toastmasters and having also been a part of starting a, a debating, part of a debating society in, in your university days. So I wanted to find out what role or what, what do you think that you learned specifically within debating and public speaking that helps you today? And what do you think that kind of skill, how do you think that can be beneficial to young Africans in particular? Mm, it's a big one. Communication is golden. It's a, it's a currency. The, the ability to, to communicate verbally and non-verbally or maybe by, through other means as well, I think it's very important. I also think that we have the problems that we have in our society because we are not willing to talk and understand each other. Um, and communication can assist in that regard. As I mentioned before, like the, the kind of, you know, background that I come from, you know, before going to the private schools, <laughs> I, I, went to, I went to a school where English was taught in Isikosa. Can you imagine? Um, the school where Afrikaans was taught in Isikosa, where maths was taught in Isikosa, but not necessarily, 
the textbooks themselves were in English. Can you imagine the disconnect? But because we couldn't yeah. understand, you know, the teachers themselves had to code switch so that they can, they can try and make sense of, of, of this material, you know, to these young and impressionable minds, you know. And it only made sense to us because we could, we could hear our language, you know, in, 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 the, in the lesson. So going yeah. to, um, you know, communication and debating and all of that, I've always been an inquisitive child. Um, I've always asked questions, um, you know, even when my mother would send me to do something, I'd always probe, why? You know, why should I? You know, not to say I won't do it, but I just want to understand. And I think the natural gift of the gap as well. So at my school, there were various spot, spotting codes, like I promise you, there was various spotting codes. And I didn't like to play netball. I was not interested at all. Um, I was not interested in the other sporting codes as well. So I thought when debating started, maybe here's something that I, that I can do. And I grew up, you know, with a terrible stutter. It is really, you know, magnificent that I can be able to speak properly now without slurring my words. So debating was great. Um, I was always particularly interested in words and word combat. It was just something I loved. So from my elementary yeah. age, you know, I started that um, junior high. I didn't really have a lot of debating happening there. And then post in high school and post high school, it was just something that was in my life. It was it was my sporting code of choice because I wasn't I don't really want to be running around and getting and, and sweating. You know, I was like, mm, I won't be good. Yeah, I won't be good with netball. I won't be good with the other things. Let me just stick to this. <laughs> and in my in my varsity, I went to the Washington University of Science and Technology, and it's one of your traditional universities in the country, right? Um, we have our shortcomings, but we do have our successes also. Mm -hmm. So when we got there, I met a couple of people like myself who were like, I'm not going to play soccer, I'm not going to play the netball, I'm not going to play that. But what about if we do this? Mm -hmm. uh, we started doing yeah. it and it assisted us in terms of communication. Um, you remember that we come from these diverse backgrounds, you know, from different kinds of schools, people not knowing how to express themselves in English, mm -hmm. not getting into a space where you, you constantly have to express yourself in this language, you know. Um, it was not only about the language aspect of it, it was also how much it helped me academically, you know, how it helped me to decipher information because debating is such a critical skill. And while I was still doing that, uh, Toastmasters International came up for and um, I joined the society, you know, ended up leading a couple of times and it was just, it was compatible matching. I absolutely love it. I love communication and also hence my uh, career path, uh, my career choice. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's quite interesting. And um, just just in general, what kind of skills do you think that, that debating and, and public speaking provided for you that you use today? Well, confidence, first of all, you know, 100%. Um, I, can, I can literally get into any space and obviously read the room first and I can engage quite critically so. Um, I also think it helped the fact that I love to read. Uh, different types of texts, so I'm able to have a world view on, on things that um, seem to be far from me, you know what I mean, because the book brings you closer. Um, confidence, yes, and the power of articulation, and also working in, in comms, you know, PR and digital marketing, especially given the advent of the pandemic, uh, assisted me greatly. I am able to communicate using digital means, I'm able to communicate face-to-face, -face. I'm able to communicate through my writing, and through semantics and, and all of those things. So, and also, I think it also helps that I'm not a monolingual speaker. I understand other languages as well so in the country. So it assists. And I think what, what Nelson Mandela said, you know, when he said, when you speak to a person in, in, in the language that they understand, you speak to their heads. When you, when you speak to them in a language that is their own, you speak to their hearts. So, and that entails communication. That in, it's, it's an art. It really is an art. And I absolutely enjoy it a lot so it assists me even um i think with the mail and guardian stuff like that and um, pitching at the donors den needed me to do thorough research it needed me to be in front of the camera it needed me to to understand how to utilize time um it needed me to you know have a sort of a persuasive appeal and approach uh, given the facts that i presented um, and various other things as well. So, yeah, I think it has assisted me in, in many, even in conflict resolution, because I do a lot of consultative work. 
um, and you find that we go to organizations and they've been having problems for years, and you find that the main problem here is, is not that you don't want to work with each other, it's just that you don't understand each other, therefore you need to communicate so that you can be able to understand each other. So there's many merits and fruits of, of this particular discipline for me that I've seen in my life. Yeah. No, that is that is quite incredible. Uh, and I can definitely see how, how that can translate very practically in, in, in how you are able to connect with people, which I think is very important. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate that. So uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you, you, you mentioned that you are the head of PR at, at Funza Literacy. Am I correct? Yeah, Funza Literacy Trust, uh, head of PR and marketing a role that I left in December 2021. Um, we had March, oh. April now, yes. So I, I left the role after, you know, a couple of years of occupying that very beautiful role that was um, a life changer and a game changer for me that bolstered me and bolstered my career into what it is, um, into what it is right now. Um, so yes, I am the former PR and marketing um, head there. And my career pretty much spans in, in PR, marketing, well, using comms as an umbrella, of course. So right now what I do, I run my own agency, my own PR and marketing agency. And um, yeah, I, I run that and it's been, you know, it is getting a business off the ground. Um, it is a dream that I've postponed for a couple of years because I was working full time and I just thought, you know what, let me jump. Perhaps the net is going to appear. So that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Mm, wow. Yo, that is that is quite incredible. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are listening who are thinking that, you know, wow, um, I, I would love to I would love to be like her and I would love to follow sort of that kind of thing like her. So uh what what sort of advice do you have for people who who see you and think that, you know, wow, that's something that's a place where I want to be? Firstly, don't be like me. Um, I think that's the first thing I'll say. Do not be like me. I, I can be quite crazy, um, but not insane. But on the real, the, I think the things that I've, I've done with my life have been so intentional. I think when I, when I developed a consciousness for my people and I developed a consciousness for my cause, and developed a consciousness and an understanding of what it is that I want to stand for, or what I want, what I what I want to live for, and what I want to be remembered for. Um, I think it dawned on me that my life is not necessarily my own. Um, I do believe that I am but a tool and an apparatus that is used for a much bigger plan that is much much bigger than me and and my comprehension as a human being. Um, the advice that I have for for people is live your life live your dreams um, using your own moral compass as a guide. Um, there's a line that I live by it, and it goes, Ipupaleas in Lema, loosely translated, it means the dream knows the way. You know, your dreams are valid, your dreams know the way. And even though they may be delayed sometimes, but they're not denied. And, and life is the best teacher. You know, the lessons that we learn outside of the classroom are the best. Um, because you know you get the you get you get the exam first before the actual lesson. You know what I mean. <laughs> so for for people who are listening, I just want to say, go for it. You know, go for it. Um, whatever it is that you put your your mind to, start with the intention of finishing. Um, no one said it would be easy, but the journey uh, that is defined by you is always the most rewarding. Um, life is not a one size fit all. We, 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 we are not meant to live the same kind of life. We are not meant to follow the same kind of trajectory. We are not meant to sort of use the same moral compass or compass as it were. Um, we are all here to fulfill our own purpose. So the minute you find your purpose, let that be your compass. Let that be your guiding star. The minute, that, the minute you find what you are passionate about, um, let that be your guiding star. And uh, live the life that you can be proud of. You know, when you go to bed at night and you take stock of the day's events, you're like, hmm, hmm, okay, wow. And this is not going to be every day because we're human. We're flawed. We are, we are prone to error and imperfection and defect. But on the backside of that, we are incredible beings. 
that are full of so much potential. We are very magical. Um, we are people of the stars and people of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So I think just go for it. Find something that you love and run with it. Mm, wow. You know, I think it's 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 such a it's such an interesting perspective. Uh, you know, I I kind of I never heard the the idea of 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 following your passion from the perspective of, you know, when you finish working at the end of the day, like do you feel like you really had an and uh, a good and worthwhile um sort of day to what you did. I never actually thought about it like that. So that's quite interesting. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, you know, life, uh, Boyganyo, has no manual, right? The, if, if we had a manual, it would be so much better for us to, to navigate life. But the beauty of it is, is the trial and error. I think that's the beauty of it. The fact that you know that you can make mistakes, but the important thing is learn from them, get better, you know, do better, be better. Um, sometimes it's your own moral conviction that will get you there, that, you, that will get you to the point where you can say, I have arrived. I mean, I myself, I'm not at a point where I can say, oh my goodness, I have arrived. But one thing for sure, I am living in my dream. I'm living very actively in my dream. And I think that is something one can never take for granted. And at the same time, I have a huge responsibility towards myself towards um, these dreams that I have, towards these young and impressionable people that I'm trying to model their behavior for, that I never asked to, but I find myself <laughs> being in a position where I'm modeling a certain kind of behavior. And in all of that, I also have to remind myself and come back home to me that I, I still have my own life to live. Um, I'm not perfect, but I'll always strive to try and do the right thing. You know, um, Sometimes it works incredibly well, and sometimes it doesn't. But we don't stop because that has happened. Hey, we continue. We saw John. We go back to the drawing board. We live life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think those are some really good words to live by. So, yes. So, as we, as we sort of wrap up, um, before I ask my final question, I just wanted to find out how can people how can people support you how can people where can people follow you on social media if they want to know more about your story that where can people go oh um well i am on the socials mm, i <laughs> i am on instagram on instagram i'm at zilu underscore nile it's just my name with the hyphen in between so that's at z i l u underscore n g i l e that's instagram um i'm also on facebook facebook i am zilungile atenjwa um you can also you know check out my business um online www.atenjwamedia.com so atenjwa is spelled a t h e n j w a atenjwamedia.com and yeah, that, that's who I am, you know, find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram, um, and on the site. I'm not really active on Twitter, but uh, if you can find me on Twitter, that's cool too. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. I think people will definitely go and, and, and check you out. Mm, thank you so much. Thanks so much. I look forward to um, engaging. And uh, thank you also for such a wonderful time with you. Absolutely. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, a great way to, to end off is uh, a question that I, I ask every person who, who, who comes on the podcast. And that is that if you knew that every young African was listening to this podcast at the moment, what would you want to say to them? We have arrived, is what I want to say. We have arrived. We, we have never not been here. <laughs> you know, we have never not been here. We are, we, we are alive, we are well, we, um, we are powerful beyond even our own comprehension. We have arrived and the world has been waiting for us to blossom into what it is that I see us blossoming into. And I also want to say, oh, isn't it just a gift also to be young, to be African, to be black? Isn't it beautiful? Um, yeah, we have arrived, definitely. Wow. 
Thank you, thank you. What a what a brilliant and what a powerful way to end off. Thank you so much, Zilingilo, for taking the time again to 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 join me and to give your wisdom and your your experience. And um, yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and I really hope that you enjoyed it and that it brought you tremendous value. If it did, please leave a rating for the podcast on whatever platform you use. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and follow us on social media at For the Future ZA. I would love to hear your thoughts on the podcast episode. Thank you so much, and have a good one.